Hi, my name is Megan. I'm an intern at Lyson Keen, and today we're joined with Mary Tooley Parker for her new exhibition, The Crystal. Thank you for coming and speaking with us. Um, this exhibition is open through March 31st, and we're very lucky to have you. Oh, thank you. Um, so first, I wanted to just start off by asking if you could explain how you got into art and kind of your practice and just give a brief description. Um, well, first, I want to thank you. <laughs> And Lysan, because um, Megan Graham is the intern here, and she does so much work and research, and you know, just just to, to come up with the questions and every new artist is it's really amazing. And she's she's studying; she's an art history BA and going for her MFA. And I I just really appreciate your your putting this together. Thank you. Just want to just you. get that out there. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> so. Um, so you, about my process? That's uh, just generally, if you want to describe your work um, and how okay. you got into art. OK. Um, it is, this, these are, well, you know, I always have trouble with that because they're, made, they're hooked rugs, but they're not for the floor. So they're not really rugs. So um, I often call them hooked tapestries or, or something. Although when I first set up my website, I called them textile compositions. <laughs> Because I just, like, I, I know that a lot of art people, if they see hooked rugs, they think craft, and it sort of it stops them right there. So um, so they are made in the, in the method of traditional rug hooking, which was a mid-19th mid century rug making technique that women, um, you know, developed when feed sacks became available. And um, they just... Um, you know, did it for their own for their own hearth or um, you know their mat coming in or whatever, um, and it was just totally in that tradition of the make do you know quilting and um, other other um, fiber arts of that time, um, and it's it's different than a lot of rug making techniques um, that are out and about today. Um, which are like tufting or latch hooking or um, punch hooking or some some tufting uses like an electric gun, so you use yarn, commercial yarn, and you and you sort of shoot it in to the canvas. Um, this is like a lot more meticulous. Um, I cut the strips with the little machine, like a pasta cutter, and um, I dye a lot of the wool for colors that I want. Um, that I specifically want to uh, incorporate. And um, I don't really, I, I really didn't think that it was art <laughs> first. I mean, I, I just, I've always loved fiber work, um, knitting and everything. And then a friend of mine actually said, you should, you should show your work. And um, so I did. <laughs> so then it just started to get into more and more shows and I, I started to really just only make wall work and also make it you know an expression of myself and which is really the art part <laughs> you know it's not just the um, manipulation of the of the fibers um, or the colors or something it was just really getting out ideas that I wanted to express um, to other people and can you walk us through the process of what it's like to make a hooked rug yeah um, it's but it's it's a long, um, not long, but it's a very um, intricate process. Um, first, I do a sketch. Then I blow up the sketch on the computer and print it out. And then I tape all those together to get the big image. And then um, I have a light box. And I put the paper pattern. And then I put the linen on top and trans transfer it with Sharpie marker. Um, and then, so then I have the image on the linen foundation. And I use linen. There's also other backings, um, like burlap is the traditional one. Um, but I like the linen because it's long lasting. Um, and um, then I start hooking. <laughs> and I don't always stick with the pattern or, that I've drawn or the, you know, the picture I, I change <coughs> or add as I go along. Um, and it takes like, well, it took the whole year to make these 14 pieces. So something like this size takes about two months. Um, and it depends if I'm dying, um, you know, if there's a color that I run out of and I need more and I need to match it. And um, that takes a few days. 
to to do. So that makes it a little bit more time. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, and then oh yeah, and then <laughs> so I have a, a frame from Nova Scotia where there's a lot of really expert rug hookers, and it rolls. It's kind of like a quilting frame, and you you attach the pattern and it rolls as you go along. And then when it comes off the frame, I hem it and sew it and block it and um, then put a sleeve and a dowel. And that is the entire process. <laughs> yeah, you can tell how much time and effort goes into all these. They're so intricate and you, you can stare at them for hours and find something new all the time. Thank you. Also, I wanted to ask how you chose the scenes for all these works. Um, you talked about planning them, but how do you choose those specific scenes and say, this is what I want to make my composition? Um, in general, I, I like get an idea of something that really makes me like tingle. You know, it's like an idea that I'm like, oh, I have to do that. Like, oh, I have to do the A, my name is Alice. Like that, that, that rug over there, um, my mother died right before COVID and then we had to take care of her estate and we sold the house and it, it, it was just thinking about all the time that we spent playing outside there and playing hopscotch and all of that, that I just wanted to do that. And the other ones also um, during, you know, during COVID and all the crazy politics and wars and everything, um, these pieces came from going back to my grandmother's farmhouse in Wisconsin where we used to go as kids, where it was just heaven. It was just so much fun. It was like riding horses and riding mini bikes and, you know, um, so many relatives and, and um, you know, she made cinnamon rolls every day. <laughs> and um, so this was like a real um, bringing joy and solace to um, to myself over the past year plus to because um, it's I and the perspectives are so weird because I I I wanted to be in the room like I I hooked it sort of like I'm standing in the room so that I can see all the way around and I can see the just the the washing machine and her sewing desk and there up in the right hand corner was a bathroom I mean, you could sort of call it that, but it was like a little tiny, you know, we were like, but, um, and then it just went outside and so. Yeah, and like you were talking about these, these bright memories of your family and your time in Wisconsin and kind of in relation to everything that was going on in the world. Um, can you talk a little bit about naming the show The Crystal? Yes, um, it's based on a poem by Kenneth Rexroth. Um, called A Long Lifetime. And it's basically about, uh, you know, uh, as you get older, just having little crystals of memories from whenever um, that, that sort of are so dear to you. Um, it's a very short poem. You can look it up on the internet. Um, it, and to me, it seemed like those moments that I chose or those places that I chose were like a little crystal that I that I've sort of saved. And, and in the, the way of a crystal, they're healing and um, shiny and bright and everything. Not that I'm into crystals, but um, it, just, it just seemed to be the right metaphor. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I can see that also manifesting in, you have six amazing portraits of your family members and mm -hmm. talked about wanting to honor them through the portraits. Right. Um, right. So how did you decide to, to use the portrait to honor these people um, and their, their memories and their legacy? Um, I really like making portraits. Um, I did a um, really large series over the past 10 years of the G's Bend Alabama quilters. And um, it was just amazing to me that I could like have this sort of black and white thing and then this person would come out of it and be there and um, really look, you know, real and, and have like a soul on their face. And um, I just, um, you know, these were, these were people that, that also actually made that time when we would go out there really special. Like um, my great aunts uh, lived they're, they lived together, there were five of them lived together after their husbands died. <laughs> so they, um, 
you know, they were really uh, like lived to 108 or 90, in their 90s, and they were wearing poochy pants and like, you know, really always going out to eat and everything, cleaning their own windows up high on ladders. And they were great. Um, and their mother was a midwife uh, on the prairie in South Dakota who had 11 children and then uh, would ride out into snowstorms to deliver babies out there in the middle of nowhere with wolves and but um, so they come from very strong stock, and that's also them in the one in the back. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had 10 o'clock lunch, 10 p.m. They would have um, lunch, like coffee, sauce, summer sausage, and American cheese <laughs> crackers and stuff. And it was like you know, their ritual. I, I really, um, I think that's why they live so long. <laughs> <laughs> have your coffee at 10 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I can tell how much how much love and care there comes from, from your family and um, and the memories that you have from your mm. childhood. Um, and a lot of that comes through with the color, which you mentioned that you dye some of your colors. But mm. I think these memories are really, um, they're so vibrant because of the colors that you chose. Can you talk about choosing the palettes for the, for the different works? Um, I mean, most of them have something to do with the actual room. Mm-hmm. Although they're they're you know you always have like the problem of is it an, is there enough contrast are you going to be able to see this, which is why I made her washer and dryer green when they're actually white, but you know that's the artistic license part so um, it just felt like that was a good contrast to that bright color in the middle which has to do with just it was such a sunny it was a back porch looking out to the cornfields and her garden. And it was um, always bright and sunny in there, and that pink just seemed to give the feeling. And that was a, a color that I created, that I, I had to dye a lot for that. <laughs> um, but I love dyeing also. I use um, regular aniline dyes and also natural dyes, um, depending on what color. Um, the, like the table in the back piece, uh, the lunch table is weld. So that's a natural dye. That takes like that's like a three day process to to put that on the on the wall. Um, the other the aniline dye is faster, but um, but you know like the blue uh, bedroom over there, it was a it was a blue bedroom. Mm-hmm. So it's just a question of like making the blue intense to to sort of intensify the memory of right. of you know bring that back and everything. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I didn't realize the dyeing process would take so long for some of these colors. That's amazing. Yeah, it's like you have to do one day mordant. Hi. One day you mordant them, it's just the plain wool, and then that has to like soak overnight. And then the next day you dye it, and then that has to soak overnight, and then you, you rinse it next the third day. So that really takes a long time, except the, it's so worth it because the, the colors are just... Um, not like regular aniline dye colors. They're they're like so intense, like that well, that's my favorite yellow. It's that table back there. That bright, bright yellow is weld. Um and you know, there's other really beautiful I mean you can achieve a lot of beautiful color, colors obviously with um the regular dyes too, but the natural dyes are like wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the cochineal and matter and Yeah, the colors are, yeah. are stunning. And I think even in person they're they just radiate off the wall, um, especially with each other. You can see how they connect around the room. Mm-hmm. Um, and something that I think you can appreciate a lot about this exhibition is it's you can tell the time that has gone into it and that it's a time-intensive process. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you would talk a little bit about the actual creation of the rugs, um, I know you've mentioned that it's, it's attention to detail and it's very slow. Um, mm-hmm. Is that sort of like a meditative process for you? Or how do you see the, the individual stitching? Honestly, I think it's therapy. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, you know, I, I just, I can't really explain it. I love it. I just love it. I love fiber. I love the feeling of the fibers, the, the wool, and I use silk or I use roving. Um, I love the process of, of, like, filling out the puzzle, of trying to figure out what to put where or what colors to use as I go along. Um, yeah, it's really slow. It's, um, 
I cut strips of wool from wool fabric with a little like pasta cutter machine, um, not like a hand crank machine. I use the word machine loosely. <laughs> and um, then I pull those strips up one by one loop by one loop with a little um, very primitive hook that basically is the same as the women in the 19th century who put a nail, a bent nail, into like a wooden stick and that was their hook. Um, so it's very, um, it's very, you know, it comes from that tradition of the make do and the, you know, the quilters that were really just trying to keep their family warm and, you know, that, it, that patience and, and, you know, they had a lot more to do than we do. <laughs> you know, I mean, um, they were, we think we're busy, but, you know, they were trying to help their kids survive and, you know, make. Their, all their food and everything, but still they were able to take the time to make these practical things and and still put themselves into it. Like it was their house that they wanted to make a th an art. Uh, it was their art, their chicken, their dog. Um, so you know, God forbid they should be making art as a woman in the mid nineteenth century, but they really were because it was it was sort of allowable because it was actually a practical result. And something that I think is great is how you use this rich tradition in mm. your work as, as like the backbone and the heart of mm -hmm. a lot of it. Mm -hmm. But you're also elevating a lot of it into the contemporary art, art world. And mm -hmm. how do you see that kind of duality between traditional and contemporary? Hmm. Um, I, I, I consider myself lucky, actually, to be doing this at this time when textiles are becoming accepted more as in the art world. Um, in New York, um, there's um, uh, textiles abound, and they're not all from an actual uh, historic textile technique, or they take a historic textile technique and, and sort of half do it and half don't do it. And um, so I'm really proud to be carrying on this tradition, which, which there, there aren't a lot of people actually doing this. And for me, um, you know, I love, it's, I just love the, um, the whole thing, the meditative aspect, listening to WNYC the entire day while I'm <laughs> looking. And, you know, um, I'm, I'm very pleased that, you know, it can be in galleries and people can learn more about this kind of, um, of rug making and, and see that textiles can be looked at as an image. Mm -hmm. I mean, people ask me, like, is that a painting or what? A painting or a textile? So, yeah, uh, you know, on Instagram or where you could, because you can't really see them on Instagram. You don't, they're very flat and you don't get all the little shiny bits and stuff like that. So a lot of people don't really realize what they are. Even in a gallery, most people don't really realize what they are <laughs> because rug hooking is sort of an unusual, this kind of rug hooking is fairly unusual. And I also know that you pride yourself on being a self-taught artist. If mm -hmm. you want to talk about sure. uh, your process and, and your, your journey into finding um, this love of this, rug hooking. Um, yeah, well, I'm really a fiber person. Um, you know, since I was eight, I've been doing embroidery and needlepoint and crocheting. And I taught myself all of that, like, from books. Um, and there are people like that. Like, everybody has one in their family. Like, the grandmother would, that was always crocheting booties or sweaters or something. There's like a there's like a thing. It's like a, a fiber consciousness out there for people that are really in, into that uh, that sort of medium. But a lot of different things in my life, you know, going to New York and I was a dancer, and then I worked at Vanity Fair, and then finally when I quit, um, we moved out of the city, and um, there was a hooking group in, nearby. So I started with that, a local group. Um, the, the teacher became my mentor and showed me how to dye and took, you know, took like where to go see rugs and stuff. So um, I just, I loved it right away. I just, mm. I just loved it. And then uh, I stayed with that group for like a couple of years and then I just went on my own and started more experimentation with the dye colors and materials that I could use and, and the images, you know, mm. like finding real images rather than just two hearts with a border, which is like a traditional hook drug, mm -hmm. you yeah. know.
Yeah, and one of the things that I I love about your work too is I feel like you can see all of the different influences from other types of art. And I know you have a background in dance and in music. Um, and how do you how do you view these all together in the scope of art? Yeah, I um, you know I never my brother was the artist in our family, so I never thought of myself as a visual artist. But I did dance and I did study piano for a long time and. Um, and then I worked in, um, you know, art departments in at Condé Nast, and um, actually learned a lot from um, color correcting proofs with the art director, and um, you know, like, no, this needs more contrast, and like, you know, comparing Annie Leibovitz's photograph to a proof is is a good education <laughs> for color mixing and stuff like that. But um, so it's just um, sort of, I don't know. I, you know, I just I just found this and I really loved it and that's um, I just kind of never looked back. Mm -hmm. I mean, I still do other things. I still spin and I um, knit and crochet. I'm currently cur currently crocheting the pizza wrap bag from if any knitters are out there or crocheters. It's a pattern of the New York pizza wrap that uh, that somebody has made into a bag. So my daughter wanted that. <laughs> yeah, there's always something you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and I wanted to just see if you had any advice for some for anyone that's looking to get into textile arts or specifically hooked rugs. Um, yeah, well, uh, yeah, the, I meant to say that like my a lot of what I've learned was on my own, and also on yeah, you know, there's so much on the internet. Like you can you can look at um, you know really authentic Canadian rug hookers are teaching classes of you know what the materials are, how to do it. You know, you can buy the stuff from them. Um, so there's a lot of. I would just say, if you just Google rug hooking, you'll you'll be overwhelmed. <laughs> I mean, there's a huge, a huge population of rug hookers in in the U.S. and Canada, um, but most rug hookers are doing rugs, and, and they and a lot do patterns. And it's, you know, it's like they want to make something for themselves, but they're not really into it and they don't I don't know carry it another step farther which is fine I mean that's what I did when I started but um, but it, it they don't and, and for some reason they don't approach art galleries like they mostly show in surface design association shows or other fiber shows of which there are many many but there's just such a they just sort of have a block that like I don't I don't think I can consider my work art mm -hmm. so Hopefully, more will come. <laughs> yeah, and I, I had I think just one last question for yeah. you. Um, just generally, I know this is all a new body of work. You made this all in 2023. Um, did you learn anything about yourself or your process through through creating the show? And where do you see your work going beyond um, into future future projects? Um, I think, like as I said before, it was a a very um, you know rewarding process going through these memories. Um, this personally, um, you know, and you know to think of like my my great aunts being in a a solo show, art show in Boston that they would be, they must be up there enjoying their coffee and like being <laughs> thankful. And, you know, like a lot of it is just to show that those people are important too. I mean, these people, you know, a lot of people um, that meant a lot to you, they should just disappear. Um, so that's sort of what, where this came out of. But um, I don't know, right now I'm hooking a Mustang like a car <laughs> um, for this is for I, I get requests for specific shows so this is for a, um, a, an album cover thing that it's going to be at the Brooklyn Navy Yard so I'm doing um, the middle of is a, a Mustang so I, it varies you know mm. like on on what I'm interested in and um, I've, I'm also working on a really really big piece which um, is, I haven't done one that big mm. I'm limited by the size of the frame but that's like 62 inches so oh wow yeah <laughs>
Yeah. Thank you so much for for answering my questions. I really love the show, and I wanted to open uh, the questions up to the audience to see if anyone has any questions for Mary. Okay. Um, I'm curious. Do you work on more than one piece at a time? I usually am monogamous, <laughs> <laughs> but occasionally, like um, this Mustang piece, it's in April, so I had to take a break from my big piece, which I really. I'm really into. What was the size of that again? The large piece that you're working it's on? It's like um, five and a half feet by six feet. But usually I just stick with one piece. I have one thing on the frame. And, and the, the break that I have, which is why people do that, like different pieces, I do other things. I do, oh. like, crochet the pizza rat bag. Mm -hmm. Or I, um, you know, I spin, I weave, I um, mm -hmm. make a sweater, make the, you know. So that, like, I can sort of go around to the different places. Because I sort of took over my entire house for my studio. Yeah, that was my next question. <laughs> yeah. You had a dedicated studio and how large it is. And yeah, I do, I do. I have a room which is called my studio um, where I have this large Chetty Camp frame um, and my wall and everything. But um, the other projects sort of take over right, different yeah. spaces. and. Yeah. My husband has been relegated to one room in <laughs> <laughs> His office pretty much closes the door and just, yeah. yeah. But um, it does spread out. I mean, fiber work is big. Like, you know, to spin a little skein of yarn, you need a bat like this big. You start with a bat. And sometimes I card my own bats. So that's a whole, you know, it yeah. takes a lot of room. Yeah. And um, what kind of loom do you have? I don't have a loom. Oh. I just have the Chetty Camp frame. Okay. I have a, I had a tabletop loom when yeah. I did the weaving, and I have mm -hmm. um, those little hand loom, those little, mm -hmm. you know, the little frame looms yeah. for this yeah. one. Yeah. I had a loom. Mm -hmm. I had a loom, but well, I they know, take I up wasn't. a lot of space. Also. Yeah, and I just wasn't into weaving yeah. as much. Like it yeah. was so uh, like geometric, yeah. and um, you know. And also, like, just the threading of the heddles. And it yeah. was, like, a huge process before. Five minutes of fun, and then a huge process That's after. That's true, right. And then so, taking it off is Yeah, yeah you know. Exactly. And I really admire weavers. And I, mm -hmm. I have good friends that are weavers, and it's incredible. Um, and also, I bought a Navajo loom. So I learned how to do Navajo weaving. And that was, you know, I just thought that was the neatest thing to have it vertical and... Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. just I had to stick with the rug. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> just I mean, love this it. Certainly works for you. So Thank you. Congratulations on Thank the show. You. It's beautiful. Thanks. Thank you. I apologize if you already covered this before we got yeah, here, okay. but um, you, the layouts, your your sort of perspectives, and I noticed some are more sort of standard perspectives, and others are more almost like architectural plans with. The individual pieces in different perspectives. Mm. How is is that an evolution of your style, or do you sometimes do them in plan and then sometimes go back to your own perspective? Basically, I can't draw. <laughs> I mean, I really. <laughs> I can draw very simple, but I do not go to art school, so I I don't think about. It. I think about where I am, you know, when I'm sitting at the frame, I'm like sitting here. And it's, so I'm, I'm sort of looking at everything going flat out this way. So I don't, I don't see it on the wall until I take it off the frame. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's almost like I'm in the room. Like I'm sitting right here and I'm making the desk and I'm, you know, mm -hmm. I roll it down and I make the little feet and, you know, um, and it was sort of that way with all of these. Like this is my um, my my grandmother's house. We go up the steps, and I was like, okay, I'm first I'll go up the steps, and I was like, wait a minute, what about the hallway? So then, I, you know, so it sort of evolves that way. And I just sort of um, like for these, I really wanted to see all the way. I wanted to see this closet because you could walk through this closet to that room, mm -hmm. and it was always filled with like all oh, wedding dresses. <laughs> so I just through it over here where it was. And that's sort of, I know it's sort of discombobulating. <laughs> that's how. 
And it looks, I don't know, to me it looks interesting. Like I, um, I left the roofs off, some of the roofs over there, because I think of the place in space. You know, so this was in space. Yeah, there was a roof, but there was all this corn out there. And that, you can feel that when you're in the room. You know there's so much corn and cows and stuff, you know. And that's what I remember. It's like not being closed in with the room, but being with the room as a starting point of all the other fun stuff and beautiful stuff and people. I think that comes through. <laughs> Sorry, if I'm allowed, I have two questions. <laughs> One is, uh, you do some, um, you do some public figures in your, uh, your portraits with the cheese men and, and you're like Ruth Bader Ginsburg and that series. And then you do all these um, very personal things. Do you um, approach them differently? Um, not really, because you know the, the cheese men series started when I went to the cheese men exhibit at the West Whitney. And they, I mean, I practically gained. I was like, I was clothing at that time when I saw those jeans and that warm material. And they also had a video of all these women singing hymns around the quilting. You know, they were all quilting together. It reminded me of my great aunts. And uh, it reminded me of all of this, like women, like together, almost in a spiritual way, creating these utilitarian things, which some of them they found over a long pile, um, and making them so beautiful. You know, and, and, and it's like this art that many, you know, women over years and years have been making art just silently for themselves. And it's practical, so you, you know, somebody can't say, what are you doing that for? <laughs> like me. <laughs> um, you know, that, that really came out of the same emotion of like really feeling connections to those women mm -hmm. um, and what they were doing with their Thank you. And the other question is, um, where does, at what point in the process does the color come in or does it evolve? Like, do you sketch in color? Do you dye all the stuff first? Like, how, how does that evolve? <laughs> um, I, I usually start with an idea of, of power. Or a color that I really want to incorporate, and then um, you know I'll, I'll put things together before I get started. But half the time I change it, uh, you know, as, as I go along, just realizing that the white washing machine is just going boring. So you know, and the refrigerator. So it just it sort of happens that way, very spontaneous. Thank you. Okay, um, I have a question for you. Oh. So um, rock hooking seems like a, a, there are a lot of women who do it. Okay. Are you seeing any male identified people doing it? There are some. There okay. Are some. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but not so common. Most, yeah, the large majority is, is mm. Mm -hmm. older women. Have you considered giving classes? Giving what? Classes. Teaching. I don't like to teach. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know I should. <laughs> I just, I get so nervous, you know, guy, like trying to prepare everything and make sure everything. I've tried it, and uh, it's just not worth the gray hairs for me. Okay. Um, so, so, no. And I, I've also been asked to, like, go on retreats and just talk to other members and stuff. So, I just want to stay home and all. <laughs> so. All right. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you talking to us, and I learned so much myself. So thank you for your um, questions. This is a thank you. <laughs> this is such a great exhibition, and it's open through March 31st. Um, so we get a round of applause for Mary. Um,